Hello, welcome to Museum Moments with Jewish Museum Milwaukee. My name is Ellie Gettinger. I'm the Education Director at Jewish Museum Milwaukee, and I am delighted to be with you on this Thursday before a holiday weekend that's a little bit awkward. You never know, you know, you're like, oh, it's the July 3rd holiday. So, and actually in a normal year in Milwaukee, the July 3rd is actually kind of feels like the holiday because that's when the fireworks and all the big hullabaloo happens. So as we're on this kind of smaller, compressed, condensed um, 4th of July weekend, I wanted to take a moment to look at something in our collection that I think gives a really interesting sense of time and space. It talks about things that are still kind of big and relevant trade and our response to trade. It looks at how uh, industry and commerce and government and all of these pieces come together. And then it also looks at what are the ways in which we try and encourage trade um, in a very micro uh, kind of case study that we're exploring today. In starting, we have to explore Phoenix Hosiery to get to a place where we can talk about all of these other big things. We're gonna look at Phoenix Hosiery as kind of a microcosm of a larger universe of businesses. Phoenix Hosiery was founded in the 1890s and bought into this moment in which women are starting to show their legs. In fact, much of their early advertising um, is uh, showing, you know, very kind of waspy looking ladies showing kind of their legs in very um, unassuming ways. So there's a great ad which shows you uh, a lady who's supposed to be a Ziegfeld Follies girl who's been selected, and yet she's not in a Follies kind of costume. She's in a long sweater and long skirt, and her legs are folded neatly underneath her. Um, but this was their logo. They started here in the 1890s, and they um, had a kind of business footprint in Milwaukee until 1959 when they sold to a larger company. But at one point, Phoenix Hosiery was, and, and Whole Proof, another Milwaukee brand, were supposedly the largest, uh, the, the most manufactured um, hosiery that was in uh, the world, in America at that time. And if we think about it, there's this big transition that starts happening. Um, and actually, this is the Phoenix Hosiery building. It's in the third ward. It's still there. There's office spaces there. If you walk through it, you can see some of the old um, advertisements and things like that. It's an interesting building. And this is what it looked like, which is you're walking through and you see when I went into this building um, earlier this year, you can see how they took these incredibly open, big spaces and they started making them appropriate for offices and things like that. Um, but it's just such a different world than the third world that we see, the third ward that we see today, and really speaks to the history of the third ward, where there was lots of manufacturing, and in fact, a number of Jewish um, textile manufacturers. And as I said, Phoenix Hosiery was a huge business. The guy at the center of the story is a guy named Ted Friedlander Sr., and he was recruited by Phoenix Hosiery to come in as their COO and later took on the role of directing Phoenix Hosiery. And he receives a call in the 1930s, in 1930, and this is where our history is having some contested questions. One side of the story we've seen is that this was in summer of 1939. This picture was taken in summer of 1939. Another side of this story is saying that maybe this is summer of 1938. Well, the timing is different. Both are speaking to kind of bigger world developments. One, the world is in the middle of a Great Depression and there has been a compression of industry and trade throughout the world. Two, there's been the development of synthetic textiles like nylon and rayon, which is suddenly causing the Silk Association to panic um, and to reach out and to try and connect with clients in the Midwest. Now, not just in the Midwest, but all over the United States. They did these meetings all over. This is the one that took place in Milwaukee. Either way, at this time, Japan is building up its war efforts that one of the reasons they're looking to uh, expand their exports is so that they can invest in their their war infrastructure. Um, and this is a big, you know, kind of moment 
before the U.S. Get, becomes embattled with Japan. And, you know, in, in three years later, this picture would have been impossible to have a delegation of Japanese gentlemen coming to talk trade with American business people just as unfathomable after Pearl Harbor. At this moment, there's this question of what is going to happen, what is the future of this uh, relationship, and what a bigger question for the Japanese Ross Silk Association, what is the future of silk? This is an article we found in the Oshkosh uh, newspaper. You can see Japan's, this is from May of 1939. So if our Japanese businessmen are coming in 1930, the summer of 1939 as um, one set of oral histories tells us, then this would, would be a big concern to them. That at that time, the trade for silk is a hundred million dollars annually. And it goes mostly to Japanese exporters. And the silk industry had been boosted in the previous bit of time based on more uh, commercial development within Japan. So the more, uh, more uh, money staying in Japan, more of the silk industry staying in Japan, but it does account for over a million households income in 1939. Over a million Japanese families count on the silk trade to ensure that they are solvent. Um, this article says that the average silk farmer would make about $50 a year. So not a lot of money in silk if you're actually at that level and that their whole parts of the society that have been directed around mulberry trees and building the silk trade and things like that, which if this uh, piece of the trade, 60% of that $100 million industry is exports, if that is decimated, what happens? So they come to Milwaukee and they are hosted by Ted Friedlander Sr., who is the um, director of Phoenix Hosiery. And this is a way, Hosiery at that point is in this kind of turning point as well to say, are we still using silk or are we using these new um, synthetic fabrics? Once World War II starts, synthetics really take over because silk is used as a war, um, is used for, as a war supply. Um, but before that, there's still this kind of question mark of what's going to happen. We know that this meeting took place in the Schrader Hotel, that they wined and dined them. Um, the people, I don't have the people identified in this uh, image, except the senator from Japan is the middle figure with the beard. And that also pictured somewhere in this picture is um, uh, Walter Schrader, who was the head of Schrader Hotel where this, this meeting took place. The Schrader Hotel today is the Milwaukee uh, Hilton, the city center downtown. It's owned by the Marcus family. After this, they send a beautiful, beautiful flag. And enclosed in, in the flag was this message that says, a message to American friends. Across the broad Pacific Ocean stretch, Microsoft threads holding America and Japan together by potent bonds. They consist of raw silk that goes from Japan to American factories and the raw cotton that comes from Southern states to Japan. So there's a symbiotic relationship here between all of these different materials. Full two million silk raising households all over Japan depend on the trade for their living. For four fifths of all Japanese raw silk is purchased by Americans. So this is really a desperate plea to say, please keep buying us. Our government and people alike therefore are bending are le lending every effort to the demand of our American friends with our ever finer quality of silk. On this occasion, we on behalf and not only of our cultivators of raw silk, but also of our people as a whole are here to present um, a few representative friendship, uh, a few representative friends in the United States, the accompanying small token of sincere appreciation, the flag of their beloved country woven from the choicest of raw silk. Now, the one thing that I wish that I had on this is um, textile vision. You know, you've heard of smell vision I wish that I had something so that I could put this pic next picture up and you guys could all feel what's going on here. That is not possible. So you're just going to have to trust me that this is an amazing specimen. It is bigger than it looks here. It's probably about three feet by two feet. Um, and the lines in between each of these 
are so beautifully woven. It is so gorgeous or dyed. Uh, it is so sharp and so crisp. And the color, this is, you know, almost, uh, it's 78 years old or more. And it's, it's still in this pristine shape. You can see how it was folded. It came in. And there are 48 stars, as you notice, because it's before Alaska and Hawaii were states. Um, just to give you a sense of that detail and that sharpness and that texture, it is beautifully wrought. It is a spectacular set specimen. And it just to, goes to show you that three years later, this is an improbability. The fact that someone in Japan would be making an American flag and sending it to the United States and the United States would accept the gift, that that is a crazy, you know, just how fast the world can spin. In addition to this small token, uh, the Japanese silk merchants send another token. And this token is great. In Ted Friedlander Jr.'s oral history, he describes this as his dad gets a call and the call is from Western Railways. And the railway company says, we have a delivery for you. And he's like, great, just drop it off. And they were like, we can't do that. It's 6,000 pounds. So the other piece of this is something, it's a piece of history that if you've ever been outside of the public museum between where the library and the public museum are situated, you may have noticed this statue. And this statue was the other piece that the Japanese business people sent. The plaque says, Japanese, uh, uh, I think it's Toru, of the, uh, it goes on to describe it. And it says it was given to Theodore Friedlander Sr. And it says that the year is 1938. So that's where our new date question comes into play. But next time you're at the Public Museum, make sure to go check this out. And then imagine if you got a call saying, oh, there's a 6,000 pound statue waiting for you. The other thing I will say about this particular statue is once World War II starts for the Americans, once Pearl Harbor is bombed, the statue is put away. There's a sense that we can't have anything that is um, philo Japanese out in the public sphere. And so it, it is put into a storage unit. And it's not until many years later that Ted Friedlander Jr. traces it, figures out where it is, and then actually pays to have it repositioned and put up. So thank you guys so much for your time and attention today. This has been a museum moment. I have enjoyed sharing this this fabulous artifact that's been part of our collection for so long. And I, I hope it gives you the sense of how we do business, how it changes, how industries change, all of those tiny pieces that this one little flag can show. Next week, my colleague Molly Dubin is going to be exploring highlights from our exhibit a couple of years ago, Jews Who Rock, in honor of Summerfest. So, I know you guys will enjoy that. If you've enjoyed this or any museum moment, please feel free to drop by JewishMuseumMilwaukee.org and make a donation. And if you have any questions for us, throw them up in the comments. We always respond. Um, and thanks for sharing this moment with me.